Pushkin. Natalia Laforcade is a force. As you'll hear when she sings during our conversation today, she has a gorgeous voice. But she's also a deft songwriter who's able to weave together traditions that feel both modern and old at once. And she's also a beautiful interpreter of song. Take, for instance, the phenomenon that was the song Remember Me from Pixar's film Coco. Or take the many instances where she's recorded some of the classic songs from across Latin America, performing songs by greats like Violeta Parra from Chile and Agustin Lara from Natalia's home state of Veracruz, Mexico. After spending the last seven years interpreting those masters, Natalia's released De Todas Las Flores, her first album of originals since 2015. The songs are very much inspired by where she's at in life now, but you can hear her reverence for the classics still in these songs. When Natalia came by LA to snag a Grammy a couple of months ago for her new album, I made a point of stopping by her label offices at Sony to have a chat with her. We discussed the evolution of her artistry over the last 25 years, the time a hummingbird inspired her to move past a creative rut, and how the logistical challenges of recording her latest album to tape wound up creating an urgency that ultimately fueled the creative process. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Just a quick note here. You can listen to all of the music mentioned in this episode on our playlist, which you can find a link to in the show notes. For licensing reasons, each time a song is referenced in this episode, you'll hear this sound effect. All right, enjoy the episode. In continuation of our month-long celebration of Women's History Month, here's my conversation with Natalia Laforcade. When did you start playing guitar? I started playing when I was 14 years old, probably. Yeah. Around that. Very, very little. I was very, very little. 14 is actually when I first yeah? started really you too? playing. Yeah, same. Uh, yeah, 14. Okay. Uh, how come? Wanted to join a band. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to join a band. I didn't think about it, you know. My mother and I moved into another apartment. That was my aunt. And in the closet, there was this guitar, like, with only three strings. Wow. And I took it. I didn't know how to play, but I took it, and then I started writing songs with three strings. Wow. Which strings? I don't remember. <laughs> I think it was this, this. And this. Okay, the three top strings. Yeah. E-A-D. Not this one's here. Yeah. So I started writing songs that I don't remember, obviously. And then one day I, I, told, I said to my mother, I want to learn guitar. So I was having somebody helping me with the rest of the strings. And I had this boyfriend that was playing a lot of judo. Songs. Oh, you too? Okay. Uh-huh. So he was giving me those three chords of, that are in many of the music and the songs, and that's how I started. Wow. Then I had my first guitar that was a Yamaha, very, very hard to play it. It was como metal strings, oh, so yeah. for me that was really, really hard. And then when I was 16, I went into the school and I said, like, okay, I'm going to take real classes So I was trying, then I got something, you know, when you... Oh, like carpal tunnel. uh Aha, yeah. Yeah. So I have to operate it. And it took a long time to go back to the guitar. And I was just learning myself by myself, you know, with my friends. Yeah. I didn't have a teacher, really, in guitar. It was my friends telling me chords and ways. When you were playing guitar, did you have songs in your head that you wanted to sound like or, or artists that you wanted to sound like? Yeah, of course. Like I had this references of Brazilian music most of the time, you know. There was a friend in school that I remember, that's the first person I asked. I said like, I'm trying to learn the chords of, of the guitar, but it doing the, the whole finger for me is just too hard. I don't have the force. My fingers, yeah. are, they don't get used to this. Yeah. Do you have any chords? It's a lot of from the intuition, the way I play guitar. But um, I was asking this friend, uh, do you have any chords that is easy to do? 
and it sounds very fancy, like very, like wow, she knows very well what she's doing. But so I want to, I want to write songs. I said, but I don't want to go just to the those chords that everyone uses, like just the minor on the major chord. No, no, the no. no. I want, <laughs> aha, I want this to sound like. Like the Brazilian More chords. interesting. So he was saying, like, I'm gonna give you some Brazilian chords, like from Bossa Nova and yeah. that music. Wow. So you can go and, and play this. It's gonna be simple for you. And then he was showing me music, Alice Somelis Regina, Caetano Veloso, Joao Gilberto, um, those kind of musicians uh, that I fall in love with. A lot of Brazilian mus music, so it, it became, because of this, in a way, this bossa nova way or Brazilian way of playing became a very strong way for me to find songs and, and music. He was giving me these chords. Yeah, beautiful. You know? So he was saying, like, if you play this, it's really easy and you can go... You can go from everywhere, like in the guitar, yeah, and it's gonna be easy for your fingers. And then he was giving me like the. So, that was my my first approach f to writing songs. So I was writing like a song there, which is called Elefantes, Elephants. So that was really easy for me to do, but it sounded like. Wow, I remember <laughs> the, the label saying like, oh, that song is really beautiful. But for me, it was simple, more simple with my fingers and my strength. That was on your first record, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. It did seem like there was a lot of those bossa nova uh, rhythms. Like on, yeah. you would hear them every so often in the first, I don't know, like in actually a lot of your music still. Still, still. Even the last album, going through very, I mean, for me, folk music from Latin America has become a very important part of my inspiration and, and the way I write songs to find my own voice. Mm. Like, that that has been very important for me. But the, the Brazilian way, I don't know why, it keeps going through the songs in a way that I don't even know why, but it, it, it is there. Like, there's songs in the last album that have that. And you got to work with Gilberto Gil, right? Yeah, but long, long ago, you know? Um, that was for... That was on your... Mujer Divina. Yeah. Like, singing this beautiful song by Agustin Lara Farolito. It's beautiful, and also like I was singing. I don't remember the song that I that I interpreted in the person when he was person of the year at Latin Grammy long ago, like twenty years ago or something like that. I was very little. You performed a song of his at the Latin Grammys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was for him. Like he was there. For me, it was like a dream because I admire him so much. And then they were asking me to go there and play for him so that was wow. really beautiful how did you get to get him on your record like in <laughs> ah, then for Mujer Divina we got in touch with his team and he was open to do that he knew about me I was impressed by that because obviously I, I thought like, of course he's not gonna remember and that's fine because it's Gilberto Gil but there was this concert in Mexico City, and I went there with my friend Queso, which is also one of the persons that was teaching me a lot of Brazilian music. And w we went to this concert, and then I get to say hello to Gilbert, and he was like, hey, Natalia, how are you? <laughs> I can't believe he's re he remains my, my name. He knows my name. And then years after that, he was uh, willing to do the, the song with me. Were you in the studio with him, or did he do no, it separate? No, really. That was okay. uh huh. That was in the distance. I hope it was like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh man, I was hoping you got to be in the studio with him. Imagine that. Yeah. And then years later, I got to do the same person of the year 
and sing for Caetano Veloso. Oh, so wow. that was also for me like oh, I can it was libros and yeah I was able to sing to him as well. I think they both are a dream for me, you know, yeah. like to get to to play together. Might be possible. Who knows? I, I, I would love that. I would love <laughs> it. So Brazilian music was like kind of the first maybe besides pop music was like, is the first like music that you really dove into. Many, many different changes and types of music, really. You know, I, I remember the first album that I bought with my money was this debut album by Bjork. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and this Mama's Gone by Erika Badu. Mama's Gone. Kwai with uh, Traveling Without Moving, those kind of albums. Yeah. And that was the music I listened in this. I was young and starting to, to have my own own taste in music you know like yeah. when you're like i am listening to this in my headphones and i like it and i don't care if nobody else is liking this music i feel connected to to this for some reason because i didn't understand the words and the lyrics yeah. on those songs i was just a music connection to those musics my parents are musicians and the music i was listening at home was ma mainly classical music sometimes boleros that my mother liked a lot. Mm. Many different genres of music, Violeta Parra, those kind of musics. So then I started listening to new things in the school. I remember the first time I heard Billie Holiday and I was like, wow, this is totally another thing. Like, I love this. And then I went through eh, La Fichera, Nina Simone. I was li li listening to Johnny Mitchell. I remember like that cassette a blue that my friend gave me and I was like oh, I can't believe this yeah. this is really Tori Amos P.G. Harvey Fiona Apple I was getting into those kind of things by my friends showing me that music because that wasn't in my background yeah. from my childhood or nowhere really Radiohead I don't, I don't know I was listening to that it, it has been changing then I was more curious about like Wait a minute, I want to hear what's in Mexico, what's in my country. When did that happen? Because it seems at some point, and maybe around Mujer de Venus, that that's when that, that was, happened. Yeah. You know, I left in Canada for one year almost. And I was very close to say, I'm not going back to Mexico. And it was a time I was not having a good moment in terms of my career. Like, I didn't know what. I really wanted to do. For a moment, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is not for me. What caused that? I think it was that I was very young. I was 18 when I released my first album. And then everything happened fast. And for me, it was just too much information. Hmm. And then I decided to have a band. And that was for me a lot, you know, because I had so many things that I wanted to explore in music. But then it, it seemed that everything was already taken by everyone around me, you know. It wasn't my decisions or it wasn't the way I wanted it to be. But I was doing that for so long that I got very far, you know, from knowing what I wanted and how I wanted the music to sound like. For me, it was like I need to go far, far from home, and I need to go to a place where nobody will know my name, and I don't know how to speak that language, and I will need to learn, and I will be free. It will be my time, and no more music. But I ended up, because of my friends, in a house full of musicians, and they were playing a lot of blues. This was in Canada? This is in Canada. So I got to listen to other genres in music and to be surrounded by that vibe, you know, of a lot of musicians around me. And that was beautiful for me. It helped me to go back into music. And then I was Got writing. You excited again. Yeah, yeah. But I stopped the music for like three months or something like that. I wasn't playing anything. There was piano guitars, any instrument, drums, anything. Didn't touch you. 
And I didn't touch anything. I was just there, like trying to recover my soul. I think it was the thing of the soul and the heart. And then there was one day I, I sat on the piano and I started playing this uh, instrumental album, which is called The Four Seasons of Love, that it isn't even in Spotify. It was just for a period of time there. I'm going to put it there. But that was the music that was coming, has not lyrics at all. It's just music. So did that you was, release it? Yes, I did. You did? But it was the only album that I owned my master. But I was selling the label in Mexico because they, of course, imagine. But I was solo artist. Yeah. But then I say, like, I want a band. And they were like, but how a band like you're solo artist no 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 I want my band and then I said like no I don't want anything I'm going to Canada and then I go back to Mexico and I'm like okay I'm gonna release an album but there is no voice in the album so the label is like what what do you expect us to do with an album that doesn't have your voice so I was like I don't know but I'm gonna release this music so for them it was like okay you do it and it's yours you can do whatever you want with that music and then I was doing my album back with my songs. So that was really good for me to go back to the songwriting. But at that moment, I realized that there was something missing to connect to people. I was connecting in a way, but not the way I wanted to connect. You know, well, I what wanted do you mean to. By that? I just wanted to have something more. How would you say it? Uh, to a very simple language through music mm. that connects to people's feelings mm. and we'll make it really plain and simple, simple not complicated. Not complicated. Because you have some lyrics that, I mean, you know, almost like I want to compare to like "It's All Right, Mom, Only Bleeding," Bob Dylan, where it's like you know, it's fast and like the words are quick and yeah. a lot of verses. And, yeah, uh huh, that's right. And a lot of references sometimes to pop culture. And, yeah, and I really wanted to make it pretty but simple, cotidiano, like just everyday language, but poetry and something beautiful. But I felt like I need to learn. I, I need to learn more. Mm -hmm. about songwriting. So Agustin Lara for me was like, okay, this guy really has amazing music. It sounded so like Mexico, so like Veracruz. I, I don't know, I just mm -hmm. fell in love so much with his music. Had you really listened to it before? Like, I bet you yes. heard it, but had you? Yes, because it's very famous songs from Agustin Lara, but not consciously yeah. about it, you know, like yeah. not really paying attention yeah. to the chords, the music, the way he moved through the music, yeah. you know. And I was trying to learn that on my guitar. And I was like, wow, this is really hard thing. Like it, it wasn't easy, you yeah. know, for me. But I learned a lot from his music. And then I was like, okay, I got to listen to Tonya La Negra. You know, singing Verada Tropical, singing Azul, those songs that for me sounded like listening to Eta James or like those beautiful music and standards that I heard in English before. But it was Spanish and it was boleros and it was tango and there was mm. many genders there that I was like, I can do this in Spanish. And th then I just started like searching for more composers, great music in Spanish. Could you do a little bit of your version of Vera Cruz, Agustin Lara's? Uh, I think I it's know. credited to his sister, but... Yeah. Something like that. Oh, that's gorgeous. It's, it's beautiful. It's very passionate. That Tonya La Negra. So it's more like, but I don't know, it's, it's so like the way we are in Mexico. We're so... Ah, like that, right? Especially, and, and maybe even more so in, in in Veracruz, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't know, like I I really felt like I want to learn to do this. Mm. I want to learn to sing this music and and write this way in my way in my universe and my approach, my own approach. I got really inspired by that music, and then I was able to listen to other composers that really affect me in a way. Like I was able to go back to Violeta Parra, go back to Simon Diaz, mm. like this 
great composer from Venezuela. It helped me a lot to find my own way. We have to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more from my conversation with Natalia Laforcade. We're back with Natalia Laforcade. Could I ask you also, because Violeta Parra is one of my favorite, and one of my favorite songs from her you did a version of, always been one of my favorites, is Que He Sacado? Something like that. I don't remember the lyrics. <laughs> is anyone, Espero que no me escuchen en Chile porque me van a colgar. <laughs> anyone listening, I feel like, should look up the lyrics of that. It's the most beautiful song maybe ever. You know, mm. one, of the, one of the greatest. Mm. She has so many. I, but, but yeah, for me, I, I don't know. It, it was really beautiful to have this approach to those musics. And not so easy. Not so easy to sing, but I'm still learning. So going back and listening to that music and learning to play it and learning to sing it, it seems like that also, it changed your songwriting, maybe. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah? Yeah, of course. I realized that when I listened to the last album that I made, and it's probably the most personal album that Mm -hmm. I have, and I think in every song there is very clear the influences that I have been able to explore through the years. There is this incredible composer from Venezuela. I love his music. As His name is Simon Diaz. You, maybe you know him. When I heard him the first time, I was like, this is incredible music, so magic, and the metaphors through the lyrics. And he uses a lot nature as an inspiration. And for me, I feel so connected because the place I live, which is Veracruz, I love it so much because of the weather and the nature around the earth. So I was learning the very, very first song that I learned by him. This is so, so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And I can see how this music has impact then maybe a song like Pajarito Colibri, which is mm. a song from my... That's one of my favorite. This is one oh, of my favorites really, you, on you the like new it? album. Oh, my God. It reminds me to those musics. How did you start that song? Mm. Hummingbird in English. The Hummingbird. I was in this beautiful place that my friend Jael has in Veracruz. It was her mother's farm. And Rocio, I actually have a song that I wrote for Rocio de Todos los Campos. And this friend, she's not physically anymore here, but she's part of my life. And she's a very important person for what I do. Like, she was an incredible artist. And in this place, I was recovering myself for something. I don't know what that was. I think we all have moments when you just feel like your heart is broken for for things that happen in life, but then everything goes so fast. Mm. And you don't get to really like connect to when you, you feel there's pain that you need to see and pay attention to, you know? So I was recovering myself from that, and I decided to go there for a month. I went there with my friend, Alan, and we were trying to see if there was music coming or not. That was for another project that I was working on. But he said, like, don't worry, I'll be around. You don't feel any pressure. Like, I'll be around if you feel like you want to come and record, we'll do it. If not, don't worry. And then I was in the room one day, and I remember that I was inside the room for many days, not being able to do much, just sleep or read or just be there and I remember there was this hummingbird coming every day like doing this in the window and I was like how come a hummingbird could come to a window go to a tree like don't come to the window or the door like there's nothing here but symbolically I felt like this bird was calling to me and Mm -hmm. it made me feel like it was the spirit of Rocio saying like come on go outside go for a walk or or come on there's life out there like you're in the bed please like come out so there was a day I was just like okay I think I'm gonna go for a walk and then I started like having morning walks 
into the forest. And then I just, this melody came to my mind. I was like, todo está bien. I was singing this. And then I went to the room and I only had a harana, which is this instrument for son jarocho. And I was playing on that instrument, the melody, and it came like that. But I didn't pay so much attention to this song, you know. Maybe because the way I was feeling for me was just a basic lyric. Yeah. Everything is going to be fine. Hummingbird. I, I, I had that hummingbird in my mind and my heart. So I didn't pay so much attention to the song until I was working with the producer of the album and I show him this song and he, he said like do you like this one and I was like well, not really so much as normal I said like we need to record this song in the album so that's why I love producers because they help yeah so that's and, how it came and the producer on your newest record De Todas Las Flores mm-hmm. is uh, Adan Horoski. that's right Alejandro Horoski, his son yeah. yeah how did you become friends with him when I was working the tribute to Agustin Lara years ago, I was asking Adan to come and sing one of the songs on the album. And then we became friends, very close, very close to each other. We love each other a lot. And then for many years we were saying, like, let's collaborate, let's do so- something together. And 2020, I realized I really needed to go into the studio and record my music and I was asking him, would you be okay to be the producer? And he was like, of course. What made you think he was the one for this record? You know, it was just a feeling in my belly. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Sometimes I move from my belly feelings. (laughs) (laughs) From your belly to your mouth. (laughs) Yeah, so I just felt it. Because actually my managers were saying, like, why Adan? And I was like, I mean, he's my friend. I had... Other albums that we were working, Un Canto por México, Musas, those were albums that made me connect a lot with traditional music from Mexico and Latin America. There were many people around those, and it was good, and I really enjoyed the process of those records. But I felt like I just want to stay with my friend and hang out with him and just to be... Silence in the studio, nobody else. Yeah. I ask everyone not to come, like the label, my husband, my managers. I was with Rocio, only the two of us, and the band, with the producer, Adana, also the, the beautiful band that I that I had for, yeah, for and this the album. The band is incredible. I mean, Mark Ribot, who's oh, played yes. with everyone, including Tom Waits, and just incredible. We love him. And, yeah, we're um, huge fans, right? Amazing. Especially if we play guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if we play. I mean, he's a ma- he's a madman of a guitarist. Just, just he's, he's crazy. What was it like meeting him and playing with him? It was amazing. I mean, I just want my life to be like that all the time. Like, <laughs> and you guys were like in Texas too, right? Like, some well, where were you in See, Texas? In Sonic Ranch, which is in El Paso, Texas, oh, great. in the middle of the desert, in a rancho de nuez. Oh, man. It's beautiful there, and Tony Ranch it has this. Amazing studio, many studios there. Adan, the producer, was listening to the songs. It was one year, and also because of the pandemic, we were taking it very slow, no pressure. And I was sending the music, and the, one day he was like, I think Mark Rie would come and record on your album. And I was like, that's really far from us like how how are we gonna make this true but Adan is really magic he's like let's call him let's just give a call I can only imagine what Adan's like just based on his dad's <laughs> films you know like I can only imagine yeah. that lineage is yeah uh, yeah you know, magical people you I know. know you know when I was I was mixing the album in Paris with Adan then he invited me to Alejandro's house to just have a coffee and I didn't want to ask for anything else but that, yeah. you know, like it was your normal Sunday, just let's have a coffee and cookies and talk. But then he was telling me, like, I'm going to read you Tarot 
to you. And he's, I was like, he's going to be your tarot reader. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so it was so. He's got to be out of control, right? He's, yeah. He, in the best way. They, I mean, they're, yeah. they are the best. It's really inspiring to be close to them. And that was the reason I also wanted to work with Adan, you know. I wanted mm -hmm. to be close to him and yeah. his magic and mystic. Yeah. I wanted to have that. And then we have beautiful people in the band, like Mark, not just Mark Reber, I mean, Cyril on the drums, mm -hmm. Sebastian on the bass. Yeah. And your Emiliano pianist Durantes. came from your, it was like your dad's piano student or harpsichord student. Yeah. Is that true? Uh, not really like that close. They became friends, really. The funniest thing is that Emiliano Dorantes is my neighbor, right? He okay. lives very close from where I live, but I mean, in, in the middle of nowhere. Right. And then during the pandemic, there was a moment we all, everyone, right? Like, please, I want to see another human being. <laughs> and we were doing this Wednesday of the week movies. Oh, cool. In the forest, in the jungle, you know, in the, just in set the up some open. In the jungle? Yeah, so we put like a blanket or something like that, and we were doing the movie theater there. And then Emiliano was coming, and we became friends because of that, because we were chatting. And then I was like, hey, would you come to the house and give me some piano lessons, maybe? Because I am free, I have time. And then he was coming, and then one day I was showing him some of the songs that I was writing, and then he was trying to play those on the piano. It was like, he plays so beautifully. His playing is incredible on this he's, record. It's he's genius and he's so... His sense of space on your... Sen and, sensitive, yeah. yeah. He's really amazing. And yeah, so he ended up recording the music and on the album. And I remember Mark Ribot, the first day, they had like this moment of musicians, you know, like... Mark Ribot saying like, oh, you're playing this classical beautiful piece and that. And then Emiliano was saying like, no, I'm just writing this at the moment. I'm, I'm just playing this. Yeah, I am playing. improvising. And, and Mark was like, everyone were like, wow, this kid has something special. And then he was like, give me a note and I'm going to play a chord. And then you give me another note. And they were just giving crazy notes that will crash between each other so to make it really difficult for him but then he was doing like a whole area or something like that like piece oh my God. out of, of that and he was playing 10 minutes non-stop wow. from what the notes that they were giving to him so wow. then Mark Ribot and Sebastian they were just like okay we're ready to go like there's not gonna be any problem this with this band. kid yeah. because he's like 20 right or something he's or 21, 21 right something. now I think yeah. yeah, there's a lot of like those magic moments in the process of the album, which I love. I, I think it's important to have that kind of connections. Yeah, it's beautiful that you cut it to tape too and not digital. You yeah, know? and also Adan came with that idea. I always wanted to record that way. Then I found out that for producers or engineers, sometimes it was like, okay, this is going to be more difficult. Yeah. And then I just didn't dream about it anymore. But with Adan, we're like, yes, let's do it. Let's try. Yeah. And no metronomes too, right? Like no click, no metronome. No metronome, no click, no beat, but the heartbeat. It was the first time I was doing it this way. It was beautiful because Adan didn't want us to rehearsal that much the music. Yeah. Actually, he asked me not to prepare any demo, mm. which I didn't. I did like three, did four it. demos of the songs. I wanted to have the brass section because I just wanted to see if this would work or not. Yeah. But the other songs, he was playing that music from the message on my phone, which was right at the moment when I wrote the song. And then from that, we were saying like, okay, this could be, an intro, so you, Emiliano, can improvise something here that would be, like, close to this. And then here you, Mark, you're going to start here. And then we were, uh, how do you say, like, making the construction of we the arrangement arranging. at the moment while listening only my voice and wow. the guitar, like, trying to grab the feelings, yeah. you know. So there were moments when we were really 
connecting and there, there were moments that were more like a mess like no this is not the right way not, no 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 please take that distortion out of the guitar we were saying to Margaret but they were like <laughs> wow I like this and but then Adam was like no 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 this is not the song for this and then he was like okay 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 I'm gonna change I mean he has so many instruments around and I don't know we were just trying things and playing. I love to do that. And yeah, the, the songs and the music started to, to come, to show its own spirit. And we were like, oh, okay, this was really beautiful. Like, let's leave it like this. Mm -hmm. and, and the good thing was that Emiliano has a really good memory. He was the only one maybe that really know the chords and the harmonies of the song. So he was ready to be there for the other ones mm. saying like no it's not this chord it's this one or mm. let's go from this place to this place but he was the guy in the room that had all that information because we were already playing the the music in in veracruz yeah so he was more oh, he like he kind of knew it a, a, a bit more yeah all those elements i think add up the record is so it sounds like so free and beautiful and Mm. It just goes so many different directions. Mm. And there's just some beautiful arrangements and beautiful songs. Thank you. And, and, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Yeah. We have to pause for one last quick break, and then we'll be back with more from Natalia Laforcade. We're back with the rest of my conversation with Natalia Laforcade. There's not a lot of artists that if you listen to the first record through the most recent record and been doing it 24 years about, yeah. they all get better, you know? Oh. And to where like, this one's like the best one. <laughs> oh, and yeah. that's just an incredible feat. Yeah, I think it's really hard to reinvent. I don't know if that word exists in English. To explore what is new for your universe as a musician or songwriter or, or artist, human. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a lot of search. And for me, this album is a master. Like, it has taught me so many important things that I want to keep close, you know, even 10 years in the future, 20 years. Like, I don't want to forget the things that I've learned through this process. Yeah. Because I think it's very important to keep trying to, to do this work, you know, like this album made me sit down, even on the stage. Like I felt like this album was saying, I don't want you to move during the concert. I just want you to play and sing and you will sit down. No and theatrics. Just no, just bring it, bring it all from that point yeah. and be very calm. And everything, I was actually thinking about this interview right now, thinking like, this could have happened like one year ago or two when I was releasing the album, right? But things like this moment has happened. Like th this album has given to me beautiful moments, but it's like in the time of this album, not the time that I want. Not your time, yeah. Not yeah. my time. And I found yeah. that beautiful because I've learned that not always you may have the control of what you're doing and the music and the way it flows. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you so yeah. much for the for the album. It's beautiful, all the music. And I'm glad also it's being recognized. I mean, you're here because you're up for a Grammy award for yeah. the album. And mm. it's beautiful that it's getting the credit it deserves. Yeah, yeah. I feel happy. I feel happy for that, you know. I mean, you're not thinking about this recognition while you're doing the thing, you know, but it was hard moments when we took the machine to Veracruz. That was crazy. You know, we took the machine to my studio once and then I got COVID. They had to take it back to Mexico City and then bring it back again to my studio. Yeah. What, what did they bring? What machine? The tape machine. Oh, the tape machine. Yeah. Okay. They were taking the, the machine to my house and everyone were there the cordos, strings, everyone, but the machine wasn't good. 
it was damaged for a oh, reason. No. And then it was two days of like, oh, let's find this little piece that we needed to fix it. And I don't know, like there were funny moments like that como in the recording process of the album. It's very, I know, so como se dice in English, it's muy artesanal. It's como handmade mm. when you try to record like that. I mean, I am not like the Beatles. They had so much money. They could buy 70 tapes or yeah. even more to record an album. But for us, it was just like 15 or maybe less, just 20 minutes for every track, 24 tracks. Would you record like this again? Of course. That's the way I want to record the most. Are you... I mean, it's okay. It, it depends on the project, I think. But I, I really loved it. Are you writing always? Not always. Recently, I've been writing. Last week, I was doing some music for a TV show that somebody asked, and I was writing a song that is called Cancionera. But not always, you know? For I am not very disciplined as a writer. Do you, do you find Most it helpful say to have an assignment? <laughs> Well, I like Must it. You, you take honest. your time. I like. I mean, I like that you take your time. Yeah, you know? it's like no. You know, I there, there's moments. That, yeah, it could be months, and I do nothing, and then there's one day, and I got inspired. I think this moment in my life, I feel very inspired, mm. but that doesn't happen always for well, me. I hope we get more music then soon. Oh, yeah, yeah me too, it's, me it's, too, it's, me it's, too. It's, I ask for that. I ask the music. It's too good. It's too good. <laughs> you, could you play one more song? Yeah, yeah. What, um, Maybe uh, Pasan Los Dias? Or? Ah, okay. I play it in a different tone. <laughs> it's not this tone. It was gorgeous. It was Italian. gorgeous. <laughs> it was gorgeous. <laughs> it was beautiful. Where it goes? Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank taking you. the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. Hope we do it again. Maybe in Mexico next yes, time. Yes, please. Yeah. In Veracruz. Thanks to Natalia Laforcade for playing and singing for us. You can hear her latest album, De Todas Las Flores, and all of our favorite songs from Natalia, along with some of the songs mentioned in this conversation, on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced and edited by Leah Rose with marketing help from Eric Sandler and Jordan McMillan. Our engineer is Ben Tolliday. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like this show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.